Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Smedberg, Chair of the WMATA Board. Thank you for being here today at our special Board of Directors meeting. Before we begin, I'll turn the floor over to our Chief Safety Officer for today's safety contact. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the event of an alarm activation, we'll exit the conference room via the glass doors and proceed into the lobby where we'll await further instructions from the security team. If we are instructed to exit the building, I'll lead the group to our designated assembly point while the security team coordinates with first responders. There's an AED located at the entry desk, and in the event of an emergency, I'll retrieve the AED and render aid while awaiting emergency services. Lastly, restrooms are located in the vestibule area adjacent to this conference room. While April showers bring May flowers, these storms also offer the potential for sudden flooding, high winds, and obstructed travel routes. Metro performs ongoing inspections of our system and monitors weather in real time to enable rapid response. You can also help Metro prepare for the unexpected by reporting any conditions that you observe to a uniform Metro employee. Learning alternative ways of getting where you need to go is an important part of preparedness. There are often multiple routes to reach a destination via Metro. Use the trip planner, Metro Rail Services, Metro Bus timetables, and system maps to enable you to plan any alternative routes. Should an incident occur that affects Metro service, information about schedule changes and detours will be available through multiple channels, including social media and alerts. For additional information on weather impacts to Metro service and how you can best prepare yourself, visit WMATA.com. This concludes our safety contact. Thank you, Ms. Emposado. Since this is our first meeting of the day, I'll ask our board corporate secretary, Jennifer Ellison, to please call the roll. Chair Smedberg. Present. Vice Chair McAndrew. Present. Alternate Director Worth. Present. Director Klein. Present. Director Letourneau. Present. Director Santos. Present. Director Drummer. Present. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. I'd like to move approval of the agenda uh, before us this morning. Uh, there's one item on today's agenda. And there's an approval for a declaration in lieu of recusal from Director Hayden Lowe. Are there any objections to the agenda as presented? Hearing none, the agenda is approved as presented. Now on to the one item of business today. I would like to move approval of the following declaration in lieu of recusal from Director Hayden Lowe. Dr. Hayden Lowe is a fellow at the Brookings Institution. The Brookings Institution is a member of a research team supported by a grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, known as HUD. The prime consultant of the research team is M. Arthur Gensler, Jr. and Associates. Among others, Brookings and HR&A are sub-recipients of the award grant. HR&A is an interested party in Metro Joint Development Matters. Dr. Lowe and an HRA and HR&A team member are the co-primary investigators of the research project. Dr. Lowe and her team at Brookings will have regular interactions for the purpose of research collaboration with HR and A staff from this month through April 25. Dr. Lowe has declared that she is able to participate in matters involving HR and A fairly and objectively for the following reasons. The work performed by Dr. Lowe and her team on the grant will not affect HRNA's remuneration under the grant. Similar, similarly, HRNA's work on the grant will not affect Brookings or her or her team's remuneration. The grant structure does not involve any remuneration exchange between Brookings and HRNA. Therefore, Dr. Lowe is able to participate fairly and objectively in board matters in which HRNA is an interested party. I'd like to move approval of this declaration. Can I get a second? Second. Seconded by uh, Ms. Klein. Uh, is, uh, yeah, is there any discussion on that? No. Okay. Hearing none, I'll ask the Board Corporate Secretary to call the vote. Chair Smedberg. Aye. Vice Chair McAndrew. Aye. Alternate Director Worth. Aye. Director Klein. Aye. Director Letourneau. Aye. Director Santos. Aye. Director Drummer. Aye. This motion is approved. Thank you. With no further business to come before the board, we will stand adjourned. I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Letourneau to begin the Finance and Capital Committee meeting. Mr. Letourneau. Thank you, Mr. Spedberg. Good morning and welcome to the Finance and Capital Committee. Thank you for joining us. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. I'd like to move approval of the agenda with one addition, an information item that summarizes the public input we've received on our proposed FY25 budget. 
If there are no objections, we'll consider the agenda approved as amended. Are there any objections by members of the committee to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Now to the approval of the minutes. We have the minutes of our February 8th meeting. Are there any objections to the minutes presented? Hearing none, we'll consider the minutes approved as presented. So on to our items. The first is an update on our joint development program and approvals for three joint development related projects. Approval of a compact public hearing staff reports and changes to the mass transit plan at Brooklyn and Capitol Heights. Improvement of approval of a joint development agreement at Dean Wood Station. Um, our newly added agenda item will also provide the committee and the public with an overview of the comments and the other public input we received on the FY25 budget in preparation for the board's discussion at a later date. Uh, we're hoping to be able to take up the budget again on April 25th. Uh, we'll see exactly how things transpire, um, yes, particularly in Virginia and uh, in our partner uh, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, but to start with, I'll turn it over to Ms. Price, our Vice President of Real Estate and Parking, for our first item. Good morning, Chairman Letourneau and members of the committee. My name is Liz Price, Vice President of Real Estate and Development. Today I'll be providing a brief joint development update and seeking board approval on several items to advance joint development projects around the region. <clears throat> Metro's joint development program helps Metro achieve our regional opportunity and partnership goals by accelerating transit-oriented development that increases ridership for Metro and tax revenue for our state and local jurisdictions. Today we will be, I will be providing a brief overview of um, activities planned within our joint development program this year, as well as seeking um, committee approval of compact public hearing staff reports and mass transit plan amendments at Brooklyn and Capitol Heights and a joint development agreement at Deanwood. By way of background, Metro delivered its first joint development project in the region at Farragut Square in 1975. Since that time, Metro has delivered more than 17 million square feet of development at 30 stations, making it the most active joint development program in the country. In 2021, Amazon Housing Equity Fund announced a partnership with Metro to provide $125 million in funding for affordable housing at Metro locations. In 2022, we issued our 10-year strategic plan for joint development that set a goal of ex ex executing 20 joint development agreements over the next 10 years. Last April, the board authorized staff to hold six compact public hearings and issue seven future joint development solicitations. We held four of those compact public hearings last year, and in December, the board approved the compact public hearing staff reports for Deanwood and Congress Heights. We are anticipating a very active year uh, within our joint development program. Our, part, our development partners will deliver four residential projects in the first half of this year, totaling more than 1,300 units, over 800 of those affordable, most of which were supported by Amazon's Housing Equity Fund. These projects include Aventon, Huntington Station, and Fairfax County. In Prince George's County, Margo, and New Carrollton, and last week we celebrated the opening of Atworth and College Park. And in Montgomery County at Grosvenor, there'll be two residential buildings delivering early summer, along with a 1.2 acre public park. Metro is also planning to release five development solicitations this year. The first one at Eisenhower Avenue Metro was released just two weeks ago, with others planned uh, this spring and early summer at North Bethesda, Deanwood, Brooklyn, and Capitol Heights. Our team is also working hard to finalize joint development agreements and excess property sales um, around the region, including two DC Public Library branches at Deanwood and Congress Heights, and an excess property sale to Prince George's County for a new library and cultural center at downtown Largo. Today we're seeking board approval of compact public hearing staff reports and amendments to the Mass Transit Plan for proposed changes at two stations, Brooklyn in the district and Capitol Heights in Prince George's County. Regarding our public hearing events, we used a hybrid virtual and in-person format for both stations. Prior to each event, staff organized a targeted marketing and media campaign to notify customers and neighborhoods about the proposed changes and hearing dates using print and online sources in addition to creating a web page, sending emails to community groups, posting signs and conducting in-person outreach at stations. 
Customers participated virtu participating vir virtually could join using a Teams link or by telephone, and the broadcast was also carried live on YouTube. Comments or public testimony could be provided during the hearing and also using an online survey form that was available 30 days before the hearing and 10 days after. This feedback was summarized in the staff reports along with Metro's responses to the concerns and posted online. The Brooklyn Compact Public Hearing was held on September 12, 2023. The proposed changes at Brooklyn include replacing the current bus loop with an on-street busway and layover spaces under Michigan Avenue Bridge, replacing the Kiss and Ride lot with eight on-street spaces, all of these changes um, will improve pedestrian and bicycle access to the station and safety. These changes also enable future joint development that would increase ridership. The proposed project is consistent with the goals identified in the Brooklyn Small Area Plan, as well as DC Office of Planning's comprehensive plan, which concentrates economic development activity, employment growth, and new housing at the station. Additionally, the future land use map also proposes an increase in development allowances from moderate to medium density here. We had significant community participation and input throughout the process. 517 comments were received. 82% of respondents supported the project or did not oppose. Only 18% um, expressed opposition. Supporters of the project noted that the surface lot was underutilized and that more dense transit-oriented development next to the station was a more appropriate use for the land and could provide benefits to neighboring areas. Opposing comments raised concerns about the removal of parking, gentrification, displacement, and safety concerns. The most comments, the most comments actually did not focus on the transit facilities themselves, but the need for improved bike and pedestrian connections throughout the site. While the proposed plan does improve pedestrian access and identifies possible future bike connections, Metro is, will continue to work with the district and the future joint developer and the community to coordinate safe bike connections to and through the area. There were also comments about the plans for future joint development as well as comments on preferred uses to be included in that development. Metro has not issued a solicitation or selected a developer for the site, but there will be additional opportunities for the community to engage as those processes move forward. We made some minor edits to the staff report to reflect the community's emphasis on multimodal station access, and we recommend that the committee approve the staff report and propose changes to the transit facilities today. At Capitol Heights, um, we previously held a compact public hearing for this site in 2017, and the board approved closure of the parking lot at that time. Given the time that has elapsed since that hearing and Metro's revised transit facility plan, which today includes changes to the bus and kiss and ride facilities as well, we held another compact public hearing on November 8th. The current proposed changes include eliminating the park and ride lot, replacing the bus loop with an on-street busway, reducing the kiss and ride capacity to eight spaces on, um, also on street. And these changes would um, enable future joint development and increase ridership. The changes are consistent with plan 2035, Prince George's County's approved general plan, which identifies Capitol Heights Metro Station as a local center, which is an area targeted for transit oriented development that will maximize regional accessibility and mobility. The approved Capitol Heights Transit District Development Plan also prioritizes transit-oriented development and economic development at the station. We received 128 comments uh, about the plan. 45% supported the project or did not express opposition, while 55% opposed, with most of those um, focused on the parking closure. It's important to note that 46% of the online survey respondents indicated that they used the park and ride facility within the last 30 days. However, in the 2023 rail passenger survey, which is our census of rail riders, um, passengers indicated that 21% of Capitol Heights customers use the park and ride facility. So this would indicate that the online survey um, about the proposed changes here um, oversample the park and ride user at the station. In addition, 15% of the online survey respondents when asked about uh, their primary reason for using the station responded that they do not use the station. Current utilization of Capitol Heights parking facility is 35%. While at the garage at Addison Road Metro Station, we have about 1,000 available spaces um, on weekdays. 
and this is about a one mile or three minute drive from the station. Enabling development at the station is also consistent with the county's general plan and Blue Line Corridor Initiative, which, which seeks to promote transit-oriented development and economic development along the Blue Line stations. Some concerns were raised about safety at Addison Road Garage. A review of crime stats showed that the volume and trends appear to be very similar at Capitol Heights and Addison Roads, but we have alerted MTPD to these concerns. Due to the low parking utilization at Capitol Heights and high vacancy a short drive away at Addison Road, no revisions to the originally proposed changes were made, and staff recommends the committee approve the staff report and amendments as noted. And finally, we'll turn to the joint development uh, agreement approval proposed today. Um, Metro's board approved joint development policies outlined the approval criteria that staff and board use to evaluate joint development opportunities. Uh, they're noted here, which is to ensure that projects maintain or enhance transit ridership safety and access, maintain or enhance WMATA's ability to operate transit services and or maintain the system. The projects have a positive net fiscal impact for Metro are consistent with local land use and economic development plans and comply with FTA guidelines. At Deanwood, um, we actually held a, a compact public hearing here as well several years ago in 2018. We received um, an unsolicited proposal from DC Public Library in March 2023 um, to build a full service branch library at this location and replace uh, the existing 7,000 square foot library, which is in the Deanwood Rec Center across the street. Given the time that had elapsed from the prior compact public hearing um, in April 23, uh, the board authorized staff to conduct another compact public hearing and to issue a solicitation for the balance of the site. We held that compact public hearing in July of last year and the board approved the staff report um, in December. Metro also has initiated the rezoning of the site which is required for um, future private development of the site. DC Public Library proposes to build a state-of-the-art, full-service, 20 to 25,000 square foot standalone library at Deanwood Library, at, at Deanwood Metro. Um, they have uh, already secured the district funding required to, to design and build the project, and they will engage a design team upon executing uh, the joint development agreement uh, and will initiate an extensive community design process that they've used throughout the city to deliver world-class libraries to many other neighborhoods, which you can see here on the screen. It will create a new landmark in this neighborhood and serve as a civic and community anchor. Staff has negotiated a joint development agreement that would ground lease the property to DC Public Libraries for 99 years. In lieu of annual rent payments, DC Public Library will construct transit facilities, including a new access driveway to our traction power substation and bus operator bathroom. They will also construct and maintain a public plaza in front of the library. WMATA plans to issue a developer solicitation for the balance of the site this spring, which could accommodate approximately 240,000 square feet of additional development, including 18,000 square feet of retail and up to 200 housing units. To accommodate future development, the site needs to be rezoned, and we have initiated, initiated the map amendment process to change from an industrial to mixed-use moderate density. We hope to select a developer this fall and execute the joint development agreement next year. In summary, we're seeking um, committee approval of the compact public hearing staff reports and mass transit plan amendments for changes to Brooklyn and Capitol Heights stations, as well as authorization to execute joint development agreement with DC Public Libraries at Deanwood. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll open it up to members of the committee for questions. And perhaps someone can Valerie, help me. Uh, Ms. Santos. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thanks, Matt. Um, thanks, Liz, for a very um, excellent presentation. As I think came up in a recent board meeting, one of the concerns um, is historically that with respect to WMATA and joint development is the perception, fairly or unfairly, that um, decisions take a long time and processes long. So I was very happy to see some timelines on here. Could you um, speak to how did the timelines that you proposed, um, are they faster, slower? 
um, give some context on how they relate to some of the recent joint development um, projects? Yeah, I don't have a good answer on sort of what the average is because I haven't done we haven't done that math because we've been doing this for quite a long time. But I, I certainly share um, perhaps the frustrations that sometimes these processes can take a long time. So um, I think with the strategic plan that we issued two years ago, um, our goal here is to accelerate development, and that's going to take changes across our processes and systems. Um, part of that is doing more due diligence up front uh, on our part to understand our sites uh, and let the market understand those, those sites when we put them out, uh, as well as working with our jurisdictional partners as well to address some of the technical or financial challenges that we, that we may know already. Um, so that when we bring them to the market, they are uh, what we hope are feasible or, or have clear, a clear path. Um, that wasn't always the case in the past, and so sometimes we would select a developer, and then there would be a long period of discovery of technical and financial challenges and trying to solve those. And sometimes, as you know, um, time kills all ideas and projects, and so sometimes we miss the moment in terms of the market feasibility. So we've tried to do a lot of that up front, which we hope will, uh, as we put these um, projects out for solicitation, um, will, one, encourage more response, um, because we're putting forward sites that have... Um, you know, clear runway, um, and then um, also more more quickly get to closing and transactions because of that shorter time frame. And if I understand the timeline correctly, I thought I saw spring the solicitation was released in about six months. You will select somebody, and then it was a little bit open ended as to when an agreement would be found. Um, and so again, completely understand. Um, what this is, and I, I think the part that's also perhaps missing is how long it took to get from concept to the release of the um, RFP. And we don't necessarily need to get into it now, but I know in terms of the next time we hear about this, it would be really helpful to see a shortening of the time frame, because uh, right now I'm guessing it's probably two years from when it was initially um, spoken about, and again, this is, it's already going, um, but it's more of a comment about moving forward. Mm -hmm. And what will be also helpful is because I think some of the perception, again, fairly or unfairly by the market or other jurisdictions, is in part because lack of clarity or perhaps opacity is the better word as to who's responsible for what. So in other words, it would be really helpful to understand, okay, these are the major approvals that had to be go through and its jurisdiction has to approve mm -hmm. versus the board versus whoever else, because that would make it clearer um, for us whether the team is moving with sufficient um, efficacy or efficiency um, and to be able to respond to some of the commentary that comes in. Yeah, I think that those are all very helpful comments and we look forward to engaging that further. I'll just say very briefly um, that I think there's always ways we can improve transparency on our processes and also just um, being really clear about what is absolutely required and, and sort of wh where those points are. Um, and so we are certainly com cognizant of that and working towards that goal ourselves. I will note um, one of the, th in the change in processes here, one of the things that we're doing differently is we're doing our compact public hearings uh, generally before we put these out to market. In the past, we put these out before we had one confirmed internally what our transit facility needs would be and, and, and drawn the lines about where the development pads would be. And so that created a, another you know, significant uh, and sensitive piece of work that happened after a developer was engaged. And so the one thing that we've learned by looking back and sort of evaluating successes and, and challenges is that the market really needs to know what they've got um, and where they can engage. And it's really helpful when Metro can be really clear about what it needs and where it needs to be and those things are primary. Um, and then we can figure out where the market can, you know, can engage with us. And so in the past, we oftentimes did that post-selection. And you can imagine how that creates uncertainty, risk, and time. And, and a lot of projects fell apart before we got to the end of that process. So as you see today, we're bringing forward, we're doing a lot of compact public hearings in the last year and a half. We're bringing those forward in general um, before we seek developers. And so that should also provide a lot more clarity. Matt, no other questions or comments on this end. Okay. Well, if there are no concerns, then I'm just going to go ahead and move these uh, motions together. I'll move approval of the compact public hearing staff reports and changes to the mass transit plan at Brooklyn and Capitol Heights stations and approval of a joint development agreement at Deanwood Station. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Santos. 
All right, for a second in there, um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Chair Letourneau? Aye. Vice Chair Klein? Aye. Director Santos? Aye. Director McAndrew? Aye. Mr. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, uh, we will now move on to our next item, which is an overview of the public input that the board received from the FY25 budget. Obviously, that public input process started at a time when the general manager's budget looks uh, different than what we are close to adopting. Um, and so that should be taken into consideration when reviewing the public input. Uh, but nevertheless, this is a, a part of our process. Um, so I will turn over to staff. Thank you, Chair. So um, really, really happy to present our public outreach and input report uh, for fiscal year 2025. This is part of our strategic transformation plan. It guides our long-term strategy and day-to-day -day decision making of Metro over the next five years. These are some of the results from our outreach. We did 34,000 robocalls to all of our Metro Access employees. Our web page was fully translated to Spanish, plus multi-language flyers in eight languages. We also did some new tactics, including next door push notifications that reach customers in English and Spanish, multi-language print ads, digital Spanish ads, English Spanish signs, and brochures in all of our metro stations on buses and metro access vehicles. We also had metro ambassadors at high ridership and equity population stations and at our bus loops. A lot of work here. I'm really thankful to our teams. Our results um, resulted in nearly 14,000 public comments and responses showing the importance of our public transit system and the uh, great effects that uh, the budget has on their daily lives. This was nearly a 33% increase from last year and the vast majority of our comments were submitted via our online survey tool. Most respondents supported Metro's capital budget proposal with 87% of respondents in favor of the proposed $2.6 billion budget for fiscal year 25. Regarding specific capital investments, most respondents prioritized allocating funds for Metro Rail Track and structure infrastructure improvements. Our key takeaways from public feedback include Customers support increasing rail service hours and maintaining affordability. Of the two proposals to extend Metro Rail operating hours, customers favor later operation over earlier mornings, with 87% support closing Metro Rail later to 2 a.m. Fridays and Saturdays, to 72% supporting opening Metro Rail earlier, 6 a.m. Saturdays and Sundays, an overwhelmingly positive response. Fair and service changes factor into our customer's travel decisions. 88% of respondents said eliminating service decreases the likelihood, likelihood of choosing Metrobus. And 57% said a fare increase would decrease the likelihood of choosing Metro. Customers do not support the proposed fare increase. Only 24% supported it. Equity populations showing less support for the proposal, including low income, 11%, and minorities at 18%. Yet, if they had to choose between increasing fares or cutting service, customers prefer increasing fares. 66% prefer fare increases to service cuts. As we all know, there's over 400 pages of data associated with this survey, and we're just so thankful to our customers for um, taking their time to let us know about their preferences and look forward to the boards uh, including their input. Happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, questions from members of the committee and then the board um, on the public input process. 
No questions or comments on this end, Matt. No questions or comments. Okay. Anything else? With no further business coming before the committee, we stand adjourned, and that is the conclusion of today's board activities. Thanks for joining us.